Right, Cannoneer versus Amavov. One thing I want to say quickly, the matchmaking needs to improve. The amount of fights that I'm seeing that are going to a decision and are not really being that entertaining fights, they've got to improve. The main card was all right on this card, but the prelims, they did not deliver. And first of all, I'll talk about Nasruddin Amavov against Jerry Cannoneer. Firstly, we've got to talk about that stoppage. For Jason Herzog's level, that is poor. He's one of those guys where he gives fighters the benefit of the doubt all the time. That's why I'm very surprised about that because go back and watch it again. When Jared Cannonier gets rocked, he's backing up against the cage. He's kind of running away and you're going to say, oh, you're not intelligently defending himself. He was trying to get his head back into it. It's not like he got dropped down to the ground. If Jared Cannonier hit the floor and he got back up and he was all stumbly, I'd be like, fair enough. And you might say that you don't have to go to the ground to stop the fight, which is true. But that is a case when you're eating so many punches to the head, you're not blocking at all, and your legs are all over the place. That weren't Cannonier. He ate a shot, heavy one, starts moving back. He's kind of like shelling up a little bit. But then before the fight ends, I believe he lands the last strike on Nasser Adina Mavov. And then he runs in and stops the fight. That, to me, looks like more of a panic. And I always thought, I had a theory. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I thought, if it would be a controversial decision, who would they prefer it to go to? A guy who's 40 years of age and career will probably be coming into an end in the next three years, or a guy like Nasruddin Mavov, who is from Dagestan and... Well, not from Dagestan. He was born in... Um, no, I've got that wrong. Let me see where he was born. I can't even remember. Yes, I was right. He was born in Dagestan, but he fights out of France. And what I was saying is how Dana White, he loves the Dagestani fighters. And who would he prefer it to go to? Obviously, the Dagestan fighter. But obviously, it don't work like that. That was just a small theory I had in my head. doesn't really mean anything. But yeah, when I saw that, I was just really surprised by how a guy can be going backwards, land the last punch, and then stop the fight. It reminds me of the Kyle Nelson, if you remember, against Bill Algio, where Bill Algio, he got hurt badly, but I believe he got knocked down. Never mind, he didn't get knocked down, but what happened is he was eating way too many punches to the chin. He looked like he was going to go out on his feet because he didn't even like counter him with any strikes, whereas Cannoneer countered him with the last strike and Think about it. How many times have we seen? Well, it's rare, but think about the times when we've seen a guy who's been hurt badly in that situation and then come back and get a knockout in that exchange. Think about your, um, what was his name? Pat Barry, Rose Number Eunice's boyfriend. I'm not going to go into detail. Against Chick Congo. How can a fight like that be allowed to carry on, but then fights like this get stopped prematurely? The Bill Algio was reasonable because he was getting beaten up and he weren't doing anything, but Cannoneer, no. And I know you might think that's a bad example to use because the refereeing and that was probably poor because the guy went out cold and then woke up again. But I'm sorry. Nasruddin Mavov, good performance by him as the fight grew on. And one thing that surprised me, how has a guy in Nasruddin Mavov's cardio looked better than the guy who outworked a guy with good cardio in Vittori. That's what I mean. MMA math, it just never makes sense. How can a guy who's known for having poor cardio, go back and look at round three against Buckley, go back and look at some of his fights, or even go back and look at the Delize fight, he slows down as the fight goes on, but against a guy who's known for having good, well, had very good cardio in his last fight, ends up having the worst cardio as the fight goes on. It makes me think he might have been taking EPO, you know in that Marvin Vittori fight. And now I'm joking. That's just a, a theory. And obviously, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh yeah, 100% he was, because I can't, because I don't know the guy. I, you'd have to go to MPMD if you wanted to know more about something like that. But I'm just saying, it just don't add up. So for Jerry Cannonier, for me, I want him to look at fighting a guy like Paulo Costa. On a losing run, would be an interesting fight. Not on a losing run, but just would be an interesting fight. And then for Nasruddin Mavel, it's a weird position. You're not getting that Strickland rematch. He wants the title. You're going to have to give him a Brendan Allen or a Marvin Vittori. Honestly, 
one of the two. And if I was to pick, I would want him to fight. Marvin Vittori would be interesting because he's a hard guy to finish. And I'd want to see if Marvin Vittori, for once in a long time, stops doing the Muay Thai and actually goes to use his grappling for once. But yeah, straight punches were working by Amavov. The leg kicks by Kananir were working early, and I was surprised. I thought the kickboxing of Amavov being light on the feet, he should be able to be able to teep them. I don't know, I just glitched for a second and then stopped them, but he couldn't. But he won a fight where some people had it 29-28 Kananir. I'm not even joking with you. I had Amavov up 29-28 because round two was um, a closer round where Kananir's just trying to wear him out. And you've got Amavov who's actually looking to land damaging strikes like crosses and Kananir's like swinging hooks at times, but because he misses, it takes the wind out of you. And Kananir, and um, Amavov's not really throwing with intention with every strike. He's just looking for placement and accuracy on the chin. So, therefore, he's a landing and he ain't gassing himself out. So, yeah. No, oh, I'm not even joking. You're not going to believe me, but Dominic Reyes against Dustin Jacoby. Last minute, I did change it to him, but you're not going to believe me because I said Jacoby round one. For me, Dominic Reyes, the one fight I want to see him fight is Anthony Smith. Both of the guys have not looked good recently. And I say recently when you're talking about form in last five fights. Yeah, they're both coming off a win. But I think that is a very good fight to make because... Dominic Reyes, for me, he can stop the takedowns of Anthony Smith. If he's stopping them of John Jones back in the day, which he should have won that fight, and I don't get how you can see otherwise, I really can't. That's one fight I would never, and I, I just can't agree with someone who says that John Jones won the fight. I can't. I honestly can't. There's nothing you can say. You can try, but there is just nothing that I can see in that fight where John Jones would have won by going for takedowns and getting hit to the body and getting hit with crosses. All the highlights are him getting clobbered in the chin. And I prefer John Jones to Reyes, but that's not how it works. And Dustin Jacoby, for me, he just, inconsistent. He really is. Like, he was coming into good form, and then he's winning fights, and then ends up getting chinned. This fight, he was never winning it from the start. But it was just unfortunate for him, because all the pressure's on him. Dominic Reyes, you might think it's on him, like, if he doesn't win, he's got to retire. But Dominic Reyes, he's taken so much damage. Jacoby's meant to go out there and win it, according to the bookies, but clearly not. And yeah, Dominic Reyes, thank God he got that win. And it was the way he was able to march him down. And he can actually take a punch. I think that long timeout was actually beneficial because if he rushed into that fight of Allberg, a good counter striker, I could just see him getting chinned by a hook. Because... All that damage. Imagine getting your orbital and your whole face smashed by an elbow of Yuri Prohaska. Then Jan Blahovic is chinning you as well. Powerful guys. And then you're coming up against Jacoby, who, in my opinion, he gets loads of TKOs, but he doesn't look like a one-punch knockout artist. He's more of a guy who will throw a few strikes and then set it up eventually. He isn't just a guy who just hits you once, you're out cold. No. He'll set it up with a few jabs and then find that right cross and put you down. He couldn't do it on Dominic Reyes. Although he caught him early, I was just so glad that Reyes' legs did not drop. But anyways, yeah, next one. Oh, and I forgot to say, I'd like to see him fight Ming Zhang Yang, that guy who knocked out Brenton Rivera. Raw Roses Jr. versus Ricky Turkios. Right, this guy is an absolute mug. And the reason I call him that, imagine telling your opponent F you before the fight and getting your back taken and submitted and getting bullied on the ground. Although Ricky Turkios looked like he landed more damage in the first round, he was getting thrown all over the place until he took Will Rosa Jr.'s back. And he's being trained by Alex Morono. And I was surprised he couldn't get the submission, but he probably felt jealous of Will Rosa Jr. Because remember, Turkios is 31 years of age. Will Rosa Jr. is not even, well, he's an adult by law, but in America, he can't even drink. 19 is a teenager, and he got beaten by him. And that makes you demoralized when you lost to a guy who he'll probably use in his word. Oh, you lost to a kid. You ain't a kid, but a teenager. And that don't feel good. But Ricky Tykos, to me, he just made himself look like an absolute mug. Because you're telling him, F you. You're coming out there throwing kicks. You're not even touching the glove. You don't have to touch the glove. But the fact that you just came out there and threw that kick. Imagine if he had knocked out Rural Roses Jr. in that exchange. Oh my God, the hate he would have got. But Rui Rosas Jr., he looks like he's one of the most entertaining guys out there. 
because he just goes out there, aggressive, first round, like his Hamzat Shemaev, chasing the submission. And he struggled to take the back early because Turkios was making sure his back was near the cage. Don't let him get both hooks in and looking to turn. And because Rose Jr. is always forcing that submission, eventually you are going to make a mistake because you're not fully like locked into one position. For example, you take the bat mount and you're like desperately trying to get your hand, try and get that hook underneath the neck, get one underneath. And because you're just forcing it and you're not looking at maintaining your control on your opponent sometimes, he can lose the position. But he has got a tight body triangle when he can lock it in. And Ricky Turkios submitted. So, um, Rural Roses Jr., you've got to start looking at pushing this guy now. I know he's young, but we can't just make him fight like this forever. So that's the type of fight I want to see because it's not just one boring grappler um, coming up against a high pace when it's a guy who also forces a high pace as well, so it'll be like a really fast type of fight. And Ricky Turkios for him, I think one more fight and he's on the verge of getting cut. I really do. Nah, I don't think that actually because of the fights he puts on, he might get away with it. But for me, a fight I'd want to see him fight is against a striker now because when you give him a grappler, he's just going to get taken down. His takedown defense isn't great. So I'm trying to think of a bantamweight where he could have like a scrappy type of fight with. One minute. Serhe Side, that guy in Canada who got robbed against Raymond Tavares. That would be an interesting fight because that was already like a brutal type of fight, which he should have won. I know it'd be a very hard test for Ricky Turkios because he's very telegraphed and stuff, but it's the type of fight that can get a fight of the night bonus. And these are the type of fights that I think need to be match made now. I'm sick and tired of seeing these boring decision fights which aren't entertaining. You're getting maybe one but a lot of them are just like your Brad Katona fight, for example. Boring. Bruno Fajaya versus Dustin Stoltfus. You know what? I was actually surprised with how good Stoltfus looked early. For a guy who's known as the meme of middleweight, he actually started off quite well when he was pushing Bruno Fajaya back up against the cage. He was shot for a takedown. He looked like he was going to take the back of Bruno Fajaya. If I'm Dustin Stoltfus... I'm more angry at the fact that I bottled the fight by not shooting for more takedowns because he was trying to strike. He actually looks huge for a middleweight. He looked like he could be a light heavyweight in there. Bruno Fajay is kind of like stubby, got that Kelvin Gastelum type of build, but he's got this stupid power and he's very, you might not agree, but I think he's quite high IQ with the strikes he picks. He knows that Dustin Saltfus is just trying to march him down, um, try and pretty much hit him with that cross. He's overextending, missing at times. So what does he do? He doesn't keep drawing him in with feints. He decides, let me just capitalize on the overextension. Spinning elbow, catches him on the chin, puts him down. But for Dustin Stoltfus, again, another fight where he does well early or is doing well and then throws the fight away. So for Bruno Fajaya, uh, no, I was about to say, is he ready for a top 15? I think he's one fight off a top 15. So if you want to give him a middleweight, give him Bo Nickel. That would be an interesting fight to do because with Bo Nickel, he's going to have to struggle to try and stop those takedowns. But on the feet, I believe he's a better striker. He's got a better IQ with striking. Bo Nickel's more of a power, like he can put you out of one punch with his boxing. But with the takedowns, I think that's where he could capitalize on Bruno Fajaya because if Stoltfus is doing it, who's quite big, Bo Nickel should be able to do it. But we have seen Bo Nickel struggle with takedowns at times to like get them. Jamie Pickett, for example, kneeing to the crutch. But anyway, so yeah, that's a fight I want to see. Dustin Seltzer, I think, again, I wouldn't be surprised if the UFC cut him. But if I had to give him a fight at middleweight, I'm not even joking. I want to see an interesting one. I'm sick and tired of seeing these boring middleweight fights. Just give him Cedrico Dumas. Right, Zach Reese versus Julian Marquez. I'm actually shocked with the way that happened, but that being said, Julian Marquez has taken significant damage, and when you take significant damage at weights so like middleweight, and you're coming up against guys who are either fresh, haven't taken as much damage and have power, it's kind of inevitable that you're going to get finished again. And unfortunately for Marquez, this will be the end of the UFC for him. I really do think it. He's got one round cardio, his chin is compromised, Zach Carice is young. He came on the contender. They'll want to push him. So for me, that was a very good win. Because 
I've thought of Zach Kreese as a can crasher. Go back and look at his highlights. The Brundage thing was unfortunate, like getting slammed on your head. But that all came because I believe he didn't grab the heel. No, the hamstring when he was doing the triangle choke. And if you don't do that and you just try and force the triangle choke and pull down on the head, you do risk being like picked up by guys who are quite strong at wrestling. So that's why if you can grab the back of the hamstring, make them fall behind, it puts you in the perfect position to either maybe even go for a triangle armbar pretty much. Really good win by Zach Kreese. And it was early. Like, his fights do not last long whatsoever. So, at middleweight, I'm not even joking. If you want to get entertainment... um, What's the word? Entertainment factor out of it. Give him Abus Magomedov. Because they're two guys who... They like to do things early. Abus Magomedov looked to be boring in his last fight by... Pretty much staying on top of Wally Alves. But Zach Kreese is that type of guy where he kind of is aggressive from the start. Whether it will be throwing kicks early. Whether it will be for like trying to shoot for an early takedown, body lock, throw you down to the ground. That is a perfect matchup. Because if Abbas tries to mess about on the ground like he did with Wally Alves. Zach Kreese is active and he's got a good bottom game. So he'll be able to throw up those arm bars on the ground. The only thing I worry about is... Zach Kreese loses his balance a lot. When he throws, he's very off balance because he swings. And especially when he throws the kicks, he can be found falling off onto one leg. And then he's now on the floor. And Abbas Magomedov will engage in that. But I think, remember, when a fighter has like one round cardio, trusting them to win a fight, it's like McKinney. It's either the first round or nothing. And even then with McKinney, you don't even know what you're going to get with him because he's got a bad chin. So Abbas, for me, hasn't got a bad chin. He's just... Cardio is an issue. And I think Zach Kreese would not knock this guy out. I think he'd look to be on the back foot waiting for Abbas to make a mistake to either try and shoot on a takedown or let Abbas get close so he can body lock or clinch. But that is a good fight because I think that's got a finish all over it. So yeah, Julian Marquez, I'm not even going to bother giving him one because I think he's out. Pagliari Soriano versus Miguel Beza. Right, I'm done with Beza. I'm done. Because if it's not a bad chin, cardio is an issue. Because when a fight goes wrong for him, it just goes really bad. Like, look at the Chaos Williams. It wasn't looking great even before the knockout. But he's meant to be good in the first round. And to be fair, you only landed seven strikes in the fight. You are gone from the UFC. How can you land seven strikes in a fight and gas out like that? Well, the reason he gassed out is because he was forcing that heel hook, I believe it was, or knee bar. Yeah, one of you jiu-jitsu guys are going to have to say. Because he was like forcing, he was squeezing and squeezing, but his foot was against the cage, so you can't fully extend the leg. And whilst he was doing that, he was kind of like in a sitting upright position well not completely upright but he was sitting at like a 90 degree angle and when you sit at a 90 degree angle you allow your opponent if they're kind of at a 90 degree angle as well which tends to happen when people go for heel hooks when you're trying to grab and interlock your hands and get the cable grip you can get hit with hooks to the head so now you have to worry about getting hit to the head whilst you're trying to pull onto the choke so you're worrying about two things at once And because you're squeezing, gassing yourself out and getting hit in the nose, which you need to breathe from, you are getting tired. And Soriano, who, in my opinion, is a poundland Tyron Woodley, was able to go out there and do what Tyron Woodley would sometimes do with wrestling, but no jiu-jitsu. And it looked like Soriano felt bad for Beza. Are they friends or something? Because how did he not get the finish in the fight? We know he hasn't got jiu-jitsu. So when you're throwing these punches on the ground, Please just finish the guy. What are you doing? Like, I was getting angry because I was like, it was so boring. You're lying on top of him. You're throwing these P-word punches where you're just tapping him on the head, doing nothing. And then when he starts going for it, the referee's just watching. It's like he's spectating, like someone in the crowd or something, not going to break up the fight or anything. So Poriano Soriano is just pretty much like, there's no point me swinging and trying to gas myself out. Because this referee ain't going to stop the fight no matter what. So I might as well just lay and pray, throw a few punches to make it look like I'm active, and then just win a decision, which 
I would have never thought of happening. But then again, when it got to the fight, I was starting to think maybe Soriano Bezer is actually mid. He is. I thought he was better than he was because he showed some promising signs of leg kicks, power, like knocking out Matt Brown. It was impressive, but he just really embarrassed me out there. And talking about embarrassing fights. Ludovic Klein against Thiago Moises. Oh my God, what is happening here? I should have known. Ludovic Klein's takedown defense has been great. But one thing that's worried me about him is his cardio. Are we all forgetting that? Nate Landwehr, of all people, submitted Ludovic Klein. But then you have Thiago Moises, and you're going to say, yeah, MMA math don't make sense. But are you telling me that Thiago Moises has got worse grappling than Nate Landwehr? You've got to be joking, because Thiago Moises is the guy who picked up Islam Makashev and slammed him onto his back. If you can do that to Islam Makashev, how can you not do that to Ludovic Klein? One, because Ludovic Klein maybe is more compact, you might say, and his takedown defense is probably elite. It really does. But then I bring you back to those fights with Nate Landwehr. I'm sorry, I just can't imagine a guy who got put in a dash choke twice, no, an anaconda twice in the fight, comes up against a jiu-jitsu specialist whose wrestling has looked good in the past who slammed the champion down to the ground, comes up against Ludovic Klein and just gets bullied, has a Shane Burgos moment. You remember that time when he got hit with that cross and his legs kind of gave out? It didn't program in his brain. And then when it did finally program into his brain, he falls backwards and the fight is over. I couldn't believe what I was watching. I really thought Thiago Moises could go out there and get a submission. Maybe if he worked more takedowns instead of being like an idiot, like pretty much. I'm sorry to say it, but why are you striking on the feet with a guy who's out striking guys who are six foot three, who pretty much beats up all of his opponents on the feet? When you are a jiu-jitsu, you're not a striking specialist. The amount of times this guy's been ground and pounded, well, only about twice, well, once, but he also got TKO'd against... Uh, what was his name? Joel Alvarez. This guy, man, he was talking about he wants a ranked opponent. You've now thrown that in the bin. You're now going back to fight in some unranked guy on the prelims again. Ludovic Klein, for me, is the guy who deserves to have a ranked opponent. And at lightweight, I was thinking it should be Rafael de Santos. Maybe that would be an interesting fight to welcome him into the rankings. But you know what? A fight that would be interesting for Ludovic Klein would be a Diego Fajaya. But then again, he needs a ranked opponent. No, you know what? I'm not going to give him an unranked opponent. You know what? Give him a Jalen Turner. He does well against big guys. But I think this one is a very, very hard fight for him. Because Jalen Turner hits hard. And if you can crack Ludovic Klein on the chin especially with a cross which Jalen Turner's got a very powerful one, he can be put down. Like, he got rocked by Jai Herbert from a up kick on the ground. Jalen Turner has extremely hard kicks. And if he knees a guy like Ludovic Klein on the feet, he's going to get hurt badly. But that being said, Jalen Turner's chin's a bit suspect. Cardio is a bit suspect. Ludovic Klein has got a high work rate early. He could get overwhelmed early. But that being said, if you overwhelm him early and you struggle with takedowns, because I don't think this is a fight where he takes them down. Although, no, no, he won't, because I was going to bring up the fight of Renato Moicano, but his grappling is high IQ, very technical. I ain't got anything bad to say about his grappling, so no. But yeah, that's the fight for Ludovic Klein. For Moises, unfortunately, unfortunately, I want to say to give him Diego Fajaya, but if I'm saying give him Diego Fajaya, that means I want him to get beaten up badly. So, for Thiago Moises, the type of fight I want to see, Orobai against Moises would be interesting because Orobai seemed to look like he was getting a bit gassed. He engages in the grappling transitions a lot. Although he's a very, a very good striker, I think he will look to grapple a lot in that fight. Because that's what he does, high pace. 
So that is the type of fight. I would have been interested in a Moises Grand Dawson, but that ain't happening now. He deserves to fight higher up after that performance. And he shouldn't have to fight Moises. He don't deserve that ranked opponent now. I'm sorry. He beat Mitch Ramirez, who I believe he came off the contender, and he's beat Mil Quazel Costa. But he hasn't got that one standout win, which makes me think, right, you need a ranked opponent. So yeah, I think that's the fight you should have. Right, Carlos Pretes against Charlie Redke. I always have this stupid moment on a card where I see something in my brain which logically I think should happen, but you've got to remember this is fighters. What you think should happen and what you see doesn't always translate to a fight because they're all different. There's different factors that go into a fight. And Carlos Pratt is way more entertaining than Charles Redke. But I actually thought he had a chance because that Trevin Giles fight, he tends to start off quite slow, Pratt is. And he was eating left hooks. And Charlie Redke, has got a really good left hook on him. Look what he did to Urbina. Flattened him out cold. But then he comes up against Prattis. And what happens? Prattis is chewing that inside leg kick. And I should have read that early. When you are a guy like Redke, who's more of a boxer, you stand heavy on that leg. You're coming up against a light-footed kickboxer who, in a way, reminds me a bit like Anderson Silva. Nowhere near his level before any of you say anything but. He has that type of vibe about him. Hands kind of low, good footwork, really good leg kicks. Very good at setting up a strike. Like, if you look at that knockout, he warned him before that happened. They were both measuring the distance. He had a chance to move Red K, but what does Red K do? He stays there for too long. And because he stays there too long and doesn't circle out, you're allowing him to bully you with the range. Pratis is a fighter where... As soon as he can find the range, he will set up that straight punch and it will work because it worked really well against Trevin Giles. Put him out cold after getting bullied in that fight. And with Radke, he didn't even go with a punch. He like hid that knee so well because he measured the distance. Radke is probably anticipating that because Pratis throws a lot of straight punches, he's trying to set it up because you'll see him Radke kind of like back up a little bit but not circle out. He's going to fire off that right hand. He doesn't do that. So he kind of like brings himself in, throws that knee, puts him down immediately, fights over. And I thought for a minute the referee was going to give him time. Like, this is not boxing. Like, why did Mackie say, this is MMA, brother? Like, this is not boxing. This is MMA. And I say that because if a guy goes down like that to a knee and the opponent's walking off kind of, Reke's on his knees, he doesn't get back up, you have to stop that fight. Like, that stoppage to me, I know referees can't be perfect, but that looks slow. Because he, he ate that knee and the referee didn't immediately jump in. It, it was like he gave him the benefit, the benefit of the doubt to see if he'd bounce back up quickly. And he didn't. And that's what they do in boxing. You don't do that in MMA. If he goes down like that, you're stopping the fight immediately. If that's Mark Goddard, he's having a fit and jumping all over that and stopping that and making it all about him. So, for Pretters, he... For me, I want to see him fight a, I don't know, he doesn't get a ranked opponent yet. But he needs to fight a guy where, he, I can't think. I'm trying to think of a guy who can mix up the wrestling very well with his range. You know what? Give him a Randy Brown. That would be a very interesting fight which I think Randy Brown would struggle, because although he's very good with the range, he doesn't tend to go for a lot of takedowns. And he has got a good jiu-jitsu game, but Pretis can defend against that. And I don't think he goes out there and tries to do that. I think he's going to try and strike with him. He's going to be backpedaling a lot, because that's what he does. He's got very good footwork, light on the feet. But when you have a guy like Pretis, who's more technical than you, in my opinion, on the feet, and finds the range much better has more knockout power than Randy Brown. Randy Brown knocked out an OAP, a pensioner, Muslim Salikov. Well, not a pensioner, but you know what I mean, an old man in his 40s. And he beat Elusio Zaleski, but there was a moment in that where he got caught in the chin with, I believe, an overhand, and he was kind of wobbly. If that is Pratis, he's got the power where it's one punch knockout power. He sets you up, you're out cold. So I think that's the type of fight I'd be interested in seeing. For a guy like Charles Radke, um, it's unfortunate for him, but the type of fight I want to see is a Euros medic against Radke because both of them hit extremely hard. 
Medic mixes up the kickboxing more, but it will give Medic time to actually... No, you know what? Scrap that. Max Griffin. But then again, I can kind of see in that go to a decision because you've got a guy like Radke who strikes, but he can be boring. That Blood Diamond fight, for example, where he will clinch if he fears the power. But I don't think he'll fear the power of Griffin because he doesn't really get knockouts anymore. He's more of a guy who will look to engage in the clinch, fight out of range. He doesn't really commit forward too much. Max Griffin, I'd like to see him fight next, actually. Honestly, I don't even want to talk about this fight with Brad Katona. I feel bad for him because he's just so boring. He really is. He's good, but he is so boring. And putting his fights on a card just makes it kind of depressing and boring. But for Butler, for me, just the can. I don't even want to go into the fight because we know what it was. It was just Brad Katona didn't really need to find the range of his box and just had to shoot at him. Butler, for a guy who's meant to have jujitsu, he had nothing on the ground. So Katona, controversial last fight. So I believe he's not getting a ranked opponent yet. It would be boring to watch. But I think he's going to have a step up. So for him at Bantamweight, the fight I want to see him have next Victor Henry. Yeah, it will have a decision written all over it, but it'll be a high-paced fight again. It's one that can be exciting, but it won't get a finish. So Victor Henry for me. And for his opponent, Jesse Butler, he's out of the UFC probably. Very soon, he is out. But I want it to be an interesting matchup because I believe he can make it interesting, but you've got to give him the matchup where a guy's going to want to bring him down to the ground and want to mess about with him pretty much. So, should we do... I'm struggling to even think who to give Jesse Butler. Simon Oliveira, if he's still in the UFC. But even then, I think that's a boring fight. So you know what, if Carlos Vera, if they have not cut him, give him Carlos Vera, because he's got good jiu-jitsu on the ground. That could be a more interesting fight. It won't be amazing... But matchmaking-wise, they'll both like to grapple with each other and we can see the jiu-jitsu more. It's not a holding wrestling type of fight. It's a jiu-jitsu match, pretty much. So, yeah. Daniel Marcus versus John Castaneda. Now, that was the fight I wanted to talk about because I wouldn't immediately talk about his next opponent, who it should be. So, good performance over John Castaneda. Got rocked late into the third round when the odds were at like 100. I couldn't believe what I was watching. Imagine if he ends up bottling it with a few seconds left. Leon Edwards against Nate Diaz type of vibes. Um, He's got to fight Chris Gutierrez. That is a very interesting fight. Two guys who have got good Muay Thai. Proper like Muay Thai type of fight. No grappling involved. That is the fight I want to see. John Casaneda. He's going to have to go back to fight another unranked guy. So at Bantamweight... You could argue you might want to see him against Brad Katona, but again, Brad Katona, I can see why they cut him. Really boring. So, you know what? John Casaneda, I wouldn't mind it. Honestly, Christian Quinones. Because he, he looks like he starts off all right, but then can bottle a fight. So, like, his chin's a bit suspect, but I believe he can make that an interesting fight. Because if they do another UFC Mexico card, maybe with... I don't know what's happening with Grasso and Shevchenko, but maybe that would be an interesting fight to put on that card. Even though he's American, I believe he's got part Mexican in him. So yeah, that's the fight I'd see. Taylor Lapalus against Cody Stamen, pure domination. It was written in the stars. Jab, pretty much move, jab, um, knee down the center, elbow in the clinch, and then... Cody Stamen's just being a punching bag. He's forcing things that isn't working because you can't force things with Lapalus. You have to be very technical and set things up pretty much perfectly to land the takedowns on him. So, for him, the fight I would really like to see, Rinya Nakamura against Lapalus. That is a very hard fight because although Lapalus can be taken down, he bounces straight back up. Rinya Nakamura, I believe he was very good in freestyle wrestling. He is very strong. He does have power. But you don't tend to see it because he likes to be very technical on the ground. He goes for a lot of high level, like ADCC level type of submissions by going for like, I think he went for like a north-south choke in one of the fights. Kimura's, 
he doesn't just go for your basic body triangle or naked choke submission. He goes for really hard submissions. He doesn't get them, but he actually attempts them and looks like he gets close to getting them, but just can't get the finish. So Lapalus for me would be interesting. Good takedown defense, striking good, and we'd see how good is Rinya Nakamura striking. Because if you outstrike Lapalus or even knock him out, that puts you in a good position. I'm looking at you fighting now, uh, not maybe a ranked opponent, but an opponent one way, no, one fight away from a title shot. Not a title shot, um, a ranked opponent. So yeah, that's the fight I'd want to see. Cody Stamen for me, give him a Damon Blackshear because with Cody Stamen, imagine he got a draw, I believe, with Song Yudong because he can mix up his grappling well. Damon Blackshear, he can be taken down. He has got a good bottom game. Interesting fight. He his striking's quite good. Leg kicks. Stamen's overhand right merchant. He struggles to find the range. It could be interesting. I'd like to see that. So yeah, that's the card. Quite mid again because we're seeing a lot of decisions and they're not like amazing decision performances. But yeah, that's the fight I want to see. So thank you for watching. Talk to you soon.